Manscaped.com. Use promo code Wrestling Future for 20% off your purchase. Manscaped.com and the Lawnmower 3.0. You are Hello, everybody. Today. Welcome to an epic episode of Wrestling with the Future. We're going back to the territory. In fact, we're going back to the Southwest Territory. I'm Angelo DeCipio. Welcome to the show tonight. My co-host, as usual, the happy haberdasher, Dan the Man Sebastiano, the smartest guy in the room. Dan, how are you doing tonight? Great. Looking forward to this conversation. I mean, we always... Oh, we always... I'm going to tell you what. There are conversations, and then there are guys who can tell a story. We got two of the best in the business tonight. Yes, sir. And let me smarten you up a little bit. I know you're a young guy, and I need to tell everybody you're the smartest guy in the room. And we let you believe that for the most part. But there was a once a, once upon a time, Daniel, in wrestling lore, there was a territory called the Southwest Territory, run by a guy named Joe Blanchard. You might know his son, Tully Blanchard. But the guys who really made that territory cook, there were three of them. There was a guy named Eddie Mansfield, a cantankerous, cranky-looking baby face, as there, if there ever was one. Um, never worked baby face a day in his life, but he was just like the boy next door. He was a good looking cat. Still is a good looking cat, in fact. Then you had this ugly old hombre of a cowboy who was a baby face. And, well, you know, I heard that he couldn't couldn't tell the difference often, Dan, between a horse and a mule, and once tried to side saddle a jackass. But we'll talk about that later. I think he's got a story about that. But his name is Cowboy, Cowboy Scott Casey, and, and they are with us tonight. And we're going to take a walk through the territory that they, by and large, built and defined. And there was one other character, Dan the Man, who put everything together. He was the linchpin to all of this, and his name was Wahoo McDaniel. And we're going to hear a lot about Wahoo tonight. So let me introduce... From the sunshine state of Florida, I think he's still there. He may be in Texas. He may be on an island somewhere. He may be in Honolulu, for all I know. Eddie Mansfield, how you doing, my friend? Angelo, I'm doing really, really good. Robbie, every time I talk to you, you're in a different part of the world. Where, where are we at tonight? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm in the great state of Texas. You in Texas tonight, all right. Now, yeah. we've got a guy that should be in Texas, but he's, I think, in uh, in in Arkansas. If I'm not mistaken. Cowboy, where you at tonight? I am in Junction City, Arkansas, believe Arkansas, it or not. Was right. now, if you were to look at the map, yeah, I was going to say, if you look at the uh, map, Arkansas and Louisiana butt up against each other, and we're right on the Arkansas line. I could probably throw a rock and hit Louisiana right now. So, Scott, so what you're saying yeah. is, is, is uh, if the United States needed an enema, they'd stick it there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Eddie, you're never one for lack of words. I love it. So we are getting started. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I told Dan the man at the start of the show, I said, we got two of the best in the business. Dan, we might get five words in the show tonight. <laughs> we might get five. <laughs> By the way, Eddie, just for the record, yes. I already put it out uh -huh. there. Um, I put up my show for tonight on Facebook, you know, telling everybody that Cowboy Scott Casey and the Continental Lover, Eddie Mansfield, are going to be on the show. And... You know, we're going to talk about, you know, Southwest and Wahoo. And Karen gave Wahoo McDaniel a big thumbs up. And she gave Cowboy Scott Casey a giant thumbs up. And when it came to Eddie Mansfield, there was a big old poop emoji there. Is that what Karen it, it did to me? Yeah, she gave you the thumbs down, Bo. Yeah. Well, you know, got... got you know, Wahoo was a little tired when he married her anyway. You know, the chief was worn <laughs> out when, 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 when he married that tired ass. And oh, so, Jesus. Um, hey, now. Oh, so, it's, you know, it's just, <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, I can't help that, that you know, she must have got him when he was drunk. That's all I can say. 
Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, let's talk about this, um, this, this, this often overlooked territory. You know, in the history uh, of U.S. wrestling, there are the quintessential territories. You have, of course, Texas, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, often go under the radar. Uh, California, San Francisco, um, Los Angeles. Don't forget uh, L.A. Yeah, yeah LA was, was was a hot ass territory. Yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, Portland, of course, the Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, all of these, you know, quintessential territories. But oftentimes, the Southwest Territory largely slips under the radar um, by wrestling historians. Uh, and some of the greatest talent in the world went through there. Of course, both of you guys, Wahoo, our friend Manny Fernandez, even my buddy David Yohannan did a trip through. So, so let, I don't know, whoever wants to take this first, maybe uh, Eddie, you can. Uh, why is Southwest often overlooked by wrestling historians? Well, because a lot of uh, wrestling historians are legends in their own mind. And uh, <laughs> bottom line is this. Scott Casey and myself pioneered uh, Southwest Championship Wrestling. We popped Southwest Championship Wrestling. We drew more money by accident than any did anybody, period, in Southwest Championship Wrestling in the history of that damn place. Well, and I we, know you we, did, and that's we why I'm a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. When we set the record at the Hemisphere Arena, they turned away 10,000 people. I and, heard. And, um, and, and I can tell you one thing. We held that record for 11 straight years until they tore down the Alamo Dome. Yeah, I believe that. I, I know that to be true. So Let me tell you, when I first... When I, I'm, I'm going to give you some history. You ask for some history, be yeah. quiet and listen. Yes, so sir. here's the history. Bottom line is this: when when me and Scott showed up at at, at, at the Hemisphere Arena, yeah. Tully Blanchard and some some jackass was on top, and they they they're in a twenty two thousand arena, right? Seat arena. That's where the Spurs played. That's where we wrestled. They only drew eight hundred people. Well, when I left and Casey left, we were drawing. We were not only drawing twenty three thousand plus but we're turning away people and this was in every arena that scott casey and myself ever went in and i know that to be true cowboy let me ask you a question how did you make uh your entrance in the southwest who brought you in wahoo mcdaniel and tully blanchard i had gotten disgusted, and I, I left wrestling for about six months. And I get a call one day from from Wahoo and Tully, and they asked me what I was doing. And I told them I was working for a security agency. And uh, they said, how would you like to come down here and make some real money? And I said, I don't know. And they said, Wahoo said, if you don't, motherfucker, I'm going to come down there and break both your arms. <laughs> that was the way he always talked to me. He never called me Scott. <laughs> Never well, call your Scott. No, I love him to death. God, I wish he was still with us. But anyway, yeah, no, I'll tell you what. I went I, down there. He liked you. He called you motherfucker. Right. <laughs> he was. Yeah. You he know, was, it is what it is. You know, and I'm not going to deny it. And and uh, I probably did a couple of others. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we got we got down there. And we started working. And uh, to be honest, and. Uh, not because I love Eddie, but I do love him. His mouth got us over bigger than anything that we ever did. I mean, I, I raised quarter horses down there. I had 60 acres, and I would raise quarter horses. And he would he would come along and just browbeat the living shit out of me. <laughs> I, you know, and I just went along with it because I knew it was going to pay off somewhere down the line. But, I mean, the the more he aggravated me, the more the people hated him. And I loved it. I thought it was great. And, and God bless you, Eddie. You know, honest to God, you made this thing pop. I, I, I went along for the ride, but you really did. And I, 
And then you know what, Cowboy, you brought you brought a, a segue in here, really important too, because you know Eddie, you're a guy who you're entire with the heel, but you're a good looking guy. You look like the boy next door. Scott Casey, you know, looked like you know, you know, yesterday's um, roadkill. I mean, nah, you know, yeah. Now let me tell you. Here's here's why it worked. I'm gonna tell you why it worked. And I had this long talk with, with, with Wahoo. Right. When I sat down, Wahoo asked me who I wanted to work a program with. I said, Scott right. Casey. He, he said, why? I said, well, fuck, look at him. I said, he looks like the Marlboro man. I said, he, he looks like every woman in Texas wants him. And, <laughs> and I said, look, you let me get some heat on him and let me talk about him a little bit. And I said, it's going to be like two brainer bulls hooking up, two young studs that every woman that, won't, uh, that, that is in that arena wants to screw. And, and then, you know, and let me talk about their husband and uh, want, wanting to buy a ticket to screw me. It, you know, let, it, let me get on the Casey and, and really get on him. And, and that's what happened. We, we, we fired them mothers up, and, and the rest is history, buddy. I mean... Scott Casey, I would have never, ever picked another guy to work a program with than him. I'm telling you, me and Scotty popped that. that I love you, Eddie. Yeah, I've never made it pop. Yeah, and it's the truth. Well, you know, I, let me, I, I've got to tell the story, and it's, it's so funny. Wahoo had, uh, it's about Wahoo, but it includes us, too. Well, we had this thing that if a little bit was good, then a whole bunch was great. Okay, you follow me there? Yes, sir. And, uh, I know where you're going with it. <laughs> we would tape our television show every Tuesday night there in, in San Antonio, and uh, it would just go on for hours, it seemed like. But anyway, we get through, we go to this place called the Diamond Gems. It was a bar, and they had this great big nine-foot-tall white polar bear there and we would sit in there and drink and Wahoo would get drunk and say I'm going to scalp the, the bear <laughs> you know because he's an Indian right <laughs> so right after the TV show we look around now there's me Wahoo uh, Tom Jones and Mill Mascaris all in, in Wahoo's big old black Cadillac I look around, there's no Wahoo, there's no Cadillac. And I went, shit, what happened? Somebody said, oh, he left a while ago. He ran out the door. I said, ran out the door? <laughs> uh, we had someone, to the, he and I were living in a condo, great place. Anyway, we drove up. <clears throat> now, honest to God, this is the truth. God, if you strike me dead, if I'm not telling you this, the truth on this. Drove up, the Cadillac's running, the door's open, the front door's open. I went, oh, shit, something, I, maybe, I don't know what happened. So we walk in, there are three piles of white foam. And under <laughs> these piles of white foam are shit. Folks, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. I hear the shower going. But, well, maybe he had a problem. So I go into the shower, and, you know, you get these glass showers. And this one, the water was probably up about a foot and a half and, and rising. And there was about $300 in there. And I went, damn, but no wahoo. So all of a sudden we hear this, oh. And then he goes, motherfucker. And I went, oh, shit, that's my cue. So I walked into the bedroom. A 280 pound man, he's curled up like a ball underneath the bed. Now, how he got under there, I don't know. And I and I, he was dating a gal at the time, and I called her up, and she was a nurse. So she came running over there, and she said, What'd you do? Oh, I wanted to lose some weight. Now, remember, I said his theory was if a little bit's good, then a whole bunch is great. This yeah. crazy son of a bitch took what was it? Two LASIK shots. A LASIK is a water shot, maybe, and and a six right. pack of Phenomet to eat. 
He lose weight. Now, can you imagine anybody in their right mind? Well, that answers the question right there. But, I mean, here he was. He's like that. He, like, I mean, he, he was so tightened up. I mean, it took us forever to get him back to normal. But that was the truth. And I, if, yeah, we heard. I, that's my story. And I'm, we no. heard. So Anywho. Now, let, let me ask you a question. Uh, you, uh, you go to the promoter and you say, I want Scott Casey. I want to work a program with him, and uh, and let's do this and let's do that. So, what do you say? And how do you approach the cowboy with this? Well, I didn't. I I talked to Wahoo. My deal. Well, I cut a deal with Wahoo that comes from Atlanta down the the southwest. Right. And my deal was that that I I get a uh, a star maker every week. Then I get to do color commentary. Get, get you know. Then I get to uh, have an interview, and then I get to pick who I want to work with, work a program oh. with. Mm-hmm. And and so, me and Wahoo, we had a bet, and 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 he said, "I bet you a thousand bucks you couldn't draw two dogs of goat shit with with Scott Casey." I said, "Are you kidding me?" I said, "I'll take that bet all day long." <laughs> and. Uh, Buddy, I, I I shook his hand, and I took that Indian's money, too. And so uh, I can tell you one thing. From a time that, that I tore that cowboy hat up, and and that was it. Game was on. Hell yeah. And, you know, I used, I, I, used to, I used to tell them cowboys, I said, man, I've been in Texas. I hadn't seen a cowboy yet. I said, y'all, John Travolta-looking bunch of idiots. I said, you, dry, you know. And in nanny goat riders and different stuff like that, and you, you, you gotta. That's what's missing today. They don't make it personal. Yeah. The people at home Absolutely. don't don't feel any personal acquaintance. It's like Scott. Scott would would do uh, interviews that 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 made people love him, and then I turn around and and do do interviews that made him hate me. And I wanted him to hate me. Oh, absolutely. That's what I was, you know, that's that was oh, my sure. job. That was your and, job, and, and that's what you got paid for. Go ahead, Dan and yeah. man. And you know what I loved about all of this? When they were going to pay us off, Eddie held them up for more money, and I loved it. I thought it was great because I figured we were probably getting screwed out of some of it. But anyway, <laughs> I'll never forget that. I looked at you, and you grinned real big. You said, ain't it grand? And I went, oh, shit. <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do to make your money, right? So, Absolutely. And that's what we yeah, did. You gotta, I mean, you got to hold. We, we held them up. That's right. Well, you know, we had you know, if you Cisco go, on the other if night. You're gonna, Hey, if you're going to draw the bank, you at least need to get paid from the bank. Well, you know, we had Larry Zabisco on the other night. He basically said the same thing. You know, we didn't work. We didn't get, we didn't eat. You know, we had, we had to work to eat. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. And and a lot of times we, we worked and didn't eat. (laughs) Why why am I even here? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh Oh, Well, let me let me ask you guys something. The, uh, the Southwest Southwest had a, a working a lot of working relationships with some of the other, especially the AWA and some of the organizations around there. Um, but you put on weekly shows, and I, if I remember correctly, it was USA Network. Um, the, the one of the time slots that the yeah. WWF ended up taking over during their big territory killing expansion. Um, I'm curious, did, did, with working every week in Southwest, did you guys travel back and forth as well into territories, or was it more of a permanent contract? Well, the, there's no the such thing as contracts. Well, yeah, uh, that, but but the, what we yeah. did was uh, <clears throat> uh, back then, uh, me and Wahoo were traveling a lot to uh, Atlanta because I I come from Atlanta, and. Uh, and Ole Anderson killed the son of a bitch, so we had to go back in and 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 try to help him to 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 get it going again. And um, and so Wahoo, the two of the things I'm, I'm really proud of is is what I did with Scott, and that that the Indian and myself 
was the first two guys on 605 on a Saturday afternoon and at 1030 on Saturday on Sunday morning on national TV. We were the first two to ever do that. And a lot of people don't know that. And yeah, they, 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 the, the, the wrestling historians, yeah, yeah. The, the wrestling historians certainly, certainly wouldn't let let my name be 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 known. But but it's okay. Well, I mean, but, correct me but, if I'm wrong. You know, the uh, the the Southwest show on USA Network was that not the first nationally broadcast wrestling territory show? I know there was a lot of local, but wasn't that the first? Yeah. Well, that and that and the Georgia Championship Wrestling it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, a you had Turner. People, you had, you had, that that you goes had, you had lost on a lot of people, you guys. That goes lost on a lot of people. The fact that Southwest really was, for all intents and purposes, the first nationally syndicated wrestling show. Besides, yeah, you know, absolutely. Course, uh, you know, the Superstation WTBS Channel 17, uh, the Ted Turner's uh, network. But right. a lot of people and, and forget about that. That a lot of great wrestling television came out of Southwest, at Texas, Oklahoma. A lot of people forget about this stuff. Let's talk about a well, wrestling I, match today. And Eddie and Scott, and I've got to talk to you guys because you were both involved in this match. It was a mixed tag team match. Uh, two big guys and two little guys versus each other. Uh, Cowboy Lang and Cowboy Scott Casey versus uh, Eddie Mansfield and uh, oh god Dan, who was it? Um, Tim, right? Little little yeah. Tim or t- what they call him? Tall? T- I don't want to say Tiny Tim, but something Tim, right? Who yeah, was it? Tiny, Tiny Tim? Tiny Tim. Was the- was it Tiny Tim or Little Beaver? Little Beaver sounds better. Yeah, I don't think it was Tiny Tim. I think it was Beaver. Yeah, I think it was Beaver. There you go. Well, I saw this. I believe Little Beaver. Not, Little Beaver sounds better, you know. I hear you, man. <laughs> but I saw this. You're a dirty old man. Uh, Tiny this, Tom was his name. This, uh, this Tom, match, okay. believe it or not, is on YouTube. Um, and I watched it today. And it was. I thought to myself, this is hilarious. And, you know, as as much as Eddie Mansfield is like, you know, the dreaded heel, he's funny as fucking shit. Because you, you were hilarious working with this little person. And, and you know, Scott Casey, you know, Scott, you're so friggin' big. I mean, you just looked out of place. <laughs> did. Yeah, it, it's you funny know, because... You love to work with the little guys because most of them are better workers than the big guys. And uh, I know uh, Cowboy Lang, I I can't remember, didn't he bite you in the butt, Eddie, or not? I'm trying to remember if he did. I'm thinking he did. But but he he did, in fact. Well, I'll tell you what. He did a little laugh up and chunked him off the top rope, too. (laughs) Yeah, I, and and I will tell you that he did in fact take a bite out of Eddie Mansfield's ass. Yes, he did. That's all on video. Well, a lot of women, a lot of a lot of women wanted to do that, you know. So, <laughs> uh, You're so nuts. You guys, we talked a lot about you guys drawing money, you know. So let's talk about the money that you guys drew in an area that never knew what money looked like. And let's, let's, I mean, I hate to, like, put the shitter on anybody, but let's just be honest about it. Uh, Up until Wahoo took the book, Southwest was in trouble. And, Eddie, you know it because you were there. Um, You know, Tully. And, you know, know, Tully, let's, let's just cut through the fucking chase now. The, yeah. the, the problem with Southwest Championship Wrestling with Tully Blanchard. Yeah, and that's where and, and the bottom line was is is that if he'd have left Wahoo alone and and left Scotty alone, we 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 would have kept drawing for another year and a half. And that's but exactly where I'm going. No, 
and he had to, he had to be on top. So that's when I told Wahoo, Scotty, I told Wahoo, you need to put Gino and that and that Tully together because Tully always needed to sleep with a belt. He always had to have a belt to sleep with. Yeah, and 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 Scott will tell you that. And oh, I know that to be true. And he tried to he tried to give me the Southwest belt. I I looked at I looked at the chief. I said, Hey, wow, I don't want no damn belt. I don't need a belt. Scott doesn't need a belt to draw money. We're selling money everywhere. We don't need a belt for what? This well, is in, in the airport. Uh, we don't need that. And it's no. funny as you're saying that people watching this right now are looking behind me at a photograph of the Southwest Championship belt, along with Wahoo McDaniel, Eddie Mansfield, and Scott Casey. It's been prominently displayed behind me. That was one of the early prestigious belts, by the way. Um, was it that he had to have it, or was it that Joe Blanchard wanted his kid to have it? No, his kid had to have it. Joe okay. Blanchard, let me tell you something about Joe Blanchard. And I'm going to say this in front of God and everybody. Joe Blanchard was a good man. All right. He had a good heart, and he paid Scott and myself good. It was his son that was the whole problem. That's how come we lost. It's like uh, I said in my network. book. Go ahead, Go ahead Scott. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just said that in my book. I talk about Tully. I mean, now Tully's an old man like me, and he, he's a preacher, but back then he was a prick. And I told him that one time. He thought he could get over with everybody because he was the, the promoter's son. No, that do not work. Not when you've been in the business as long as we had. And, uh, but, you know, age humbles you, and you learn humility, and, and, uh, he, I, I, talked to him hadn't talked to him in what 30 40 years and i saw him at the gathering in charlotte north carolina and we talked and i told him i said you know what uh tully i said you were a prick he said i know <laughs> i well, just scott, enjoyed it but i mean that. yeah right along them lines scott let me ask you did uh did tully have this this notion that he was better than he actually was because i as a fan oh you know, yeah before I got into the business, like like everybody, I was a fan. And I always got the feeling that Tully felt like he was really better than everybody. That he was better than he actually was. You know? Well, I, I tell you, feeling he, from yeah, he, that uh, lines, you're right. He, he probably did. The thing about Tully was, and a lot of people don't know it, he was a hell of a football player. He was a quarterback. And he even had Roger Staubach training him up in Dallas. He would go up there and work with, with Roger. And then he got into a car accident and tore his uh, lat muscle on the right side, and he was right-handed. And uh, that ended his football career. Well, maybe that made him want to go sour. I don't know. But, I mean, he yeah. just well, I know talked. that story about his Sure, you know, I mean, but. Yeah, that that's, by the way, what? documented, too. He had, he had a, a promising football career that was cut short really quickly, too. Go ahead, Dan, the man. Well, they, well let, me, let me tell you the truth about this. He, <laughs> hey, Tully Blanchard, the only, only school that would give him a damn scholarship was uh, West Texas, all right? Yes. If he was so highly touted, why would West Texas want the son of a bitch? He led West Texas in the most interceptions in history. And the, uh, you know who the scholarship was granted to him by? Scott, did you know this? You know, you know no. who, who gave him the scholarship to West Texas? Was the Funk Scholarship. No, who? Yeah, oh, Terry Funk. Uh, and Dorian Funk Terry? And, and Senior. That Funk Scholarship of the West Texas. We did. I don't know if they still oh, have gosh. it now, but... But that's how he got the damn college scholarship. And what was old? What was the guy from the Eagles that was down there? That uh, was his name, uh, Richard. Richard. What was his name? He used to play tight end for the for Osborne. The he, uh, yeah, Richard Osborne. Osborne. Oh, Richard. Yeah. And so we were in there uh, 
uh, HD and, and Wahoo, myself, we were in uh, Turtle Creek, you know, at, at the golf, golf club. And Richard looked at me and he said, that Tully Blanchard's not worth a shit. He couldn't, he, he wasn't worth a shit as a quarterback, and he's not, he's not worth a shit as a wrestler. And he said, he, he threw the most interceptions in the history of West Texas. And he said, and that's hard to do because they don't play anybody. And I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> oh, shit. And so oh, I, I looked at Richard, I looked at Richard, and I said, oh, Lord. And he said, he's horrible. He just, he just pitiful. And so, but Richard, he went on, you know, to be, be the, he was the first guy to do a seven up commercial for, uh, for the, uh, for the Eagles. Uh, he was a tight end and he got, he got stuck in his eye and he got double vision and it cost him his career. He was a good guy though. Richard Osborne. He was really a good guy. Yeah, Crazy thanks. from a gun, but he was a good one. I'll never forget what he told me. I like to die. Well, let me let me <laughs> jump in hard. Let me let me jump in here real quick. You you, you were talking about uh, Tully having the uh, ha- having you know be with the belt and everything. And I know if I remember correctly, he was something like a nine or ten time yeah, champion. Yeah, I don't like hey hey hey. Let, I don't like that. Waste too much time talking about Tully. Well, I don't know. That's why I was transitioning to this <laughs> question. Um, you know, with with some of the other obviously with him being forced to dominate the scene, was there discussions among like a lower card title? I know you guys had a version of a television championship and, and some other things. And obviously, you know, both, you both had success with tag in the tag division. Was there talks of doing more, uh, undercard since the main event scene was kind of monopolized? Well, let me tell you, he tried to put himself on top, and Scott Casey and myself were drawing all the houses. And finally, the shit didn't work any longer. Because I went to Wahoo and I said, hey, this is bullshit. This is not, we're, we're drawing all the houses, Wahoo. How come, how come all you, you wasn't drawing all this before Scott and me? You had the same well, the, damn people. You well, know, let, let me, no, me and Scott, me and Scott, we, we, we were main eventers, buddy. We popped that we we popped Southwest Championship Wrestling. We put it on the map, or it wouldn't have ever been on the map. Period. Complete, completely fair. And and the fact that if you say do a YouTube search or an independent search on Southwest Championship Wrestling, probably eight of the t- the first ten sites or some segment featuring you, one of you two or both of you, which. I want to follow up something Angelo brought up because I know we had talked about it last time with the the, the tag match, the, the t- mixed mix tag match you had with the uh, shorter gentleman. Um, there's a lot of of gimmicky stuff. Like like at, at what point was there any any point where you guys were constantly, I mean, on a weekly, monthly involved in in angles and gimmicks and and interfering in each other's bits and you know uh, uh, maybe some side matches where the other had to get involved. Was there ever a point where you, you felt like your long term rivalry was getting stale, or did you keep coming up with new things and and it just worked everything you did? Well, they just kept coming up with things to do, you know. I mean, I can tell you like this. We had to work our ass off to get the people to come back. And we did it, and they came back. And it's, it's like, it, this is my own public personal opinion. Uh, nowadays, I mean, like, we would start out, tell a story, and do the match, and have a pop, and boom, somebody would win. Nowadays, they go out there and they go. They start at 100 miles an hour and work their way up to 500 miles an hour. And I, I don't understand it. And evidently, it pays off because the guys are getting exorbitant money. But uh, and it's not jealousy. I mean, God bless them. I hope they make it. But it just didn't. You know, you we had we were trained and taught a different way. It was a different time in wrestling, and we. We had to work our ass off to make it, but we did, and, you know, you enjoyed it. But like you said, every every week, you know, like Wahoo and Tully and, and me and, and Eddie would sit down, and we'd go over angles. Well, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of like a pyramid. It's wide at the bottom and starts up to the top, you know, and we had to make it work. 
and we had to. We worked our ass off to do it. You know, we did a lot of uh, a lot of blood, a lot of you name it, and we had to work hard yeah, for it. Stabbing and, my uh, happy, I just yeah, think stabbing my happy ass. You you didn't mind, it, it, and you know I, I want to tell somebody Scott Casey when we were doing the hair versus hair stuff, it was really cool. We probably had the first scissors match, you know, on a pole that I can remember of in wrestling. Could you remember of another scissors pole? <laughs> It, it was, in fact, the first. <clears throat> That's a fact. That was the and first so, one. But, but one thing about it, people didn't understand that, that Scott Casey can cut hair. And Scott <laughs> yeah, cut I, my I, hair. I did, I did men and women. Nice. Yeah. I yeah, had a special so on Wednesdays case. for the ladies. I did. Yeah, he's a hell of a <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, yes. So let me but ask I guarantee Scott, one thing. But... Hey, let me finish my story before I was really interrupted. And so, well, that's okay. bottom line is this. Because I'm hey, going to really interrupt well, you some more I'd too, grab, hey, I'd, I'd get that, that damn Scott. You know, I'd do the old sheet gimmick. I'd get, I'd get that damn scissors off that pole. And then, boom, you know, Scotty would, would, would hit me in the gut. And boom, the damn scissors fly up. He'd grab them. And then he'd grab my hair. But he could cut my hair so clean, foo, and and he knew how to cut it, and he could throw it up in the air, and you would swear on your mother's eyes that he cut half my hair off, mm-hmm. and and that's the kind of stuff that we could do that a lot of people couldn't do. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's what made people believe in us, and it's like Shawn Michaels said at at, at, at the Cauliflower Alley Club. And and he said it to, to Scott because I don't know I don't attend them, but uh, he, he he said to Scott that that was the third best matches he's ever seen in in his whole whole career, and in yeah. professional wrestling was a hair versus hair uh, uh, with Scott and myself, and you know yeah. that's that's quite that's quite a accomplishment, you know. It for, sure is a matter of fact that yeah. Uh, we actually reached out to the WWE to uh, to get a word from Shawn Michaels. We have not heard back. In fact, I told Scott about that. Um, uh, even to the point where I called the I was, center. But, I mean, you know, he, he, I was surprised that he he paid us that type of compliment. You know, I mean, Shawn had just been in the business for less than a year, maybe when when he saw that, and uh, it just. I was you know, flabbergasted because here this guy has made millions of dollars, millions of dollars. Yeah. And, uh, but you have to remember, the- too, Scott, that before, it's like I said before, before he got into the business, he was just like all of us. He was a fan first. So he appreciated great sure. wrestling. Speaking of great wrestling, Scott Casey, Southwest Uh-oh. Championship Wrestling, there was an angle that you were involved in one of the most talked about of the time involving Cowboy Scott Casey and a gentleman named Bobby Jaggers. Walk me through that fiasco. <laughs> well, Walk me through Bobby Jaggers. You know, a lot of different things done over the years, and people say, oh, well, it's going to kill this, it's going to kill that. But you can't kill wrestling. People love to come and see it. But the th- what you're referring to is... I had uh, 60 acres of land, and I had a lot of horses out there, and they would drop horse shit all the time, and we worked an angle where I took and filled a 20-gallon bucket full of horse shit, and uh, Bobby was up on the podium with Steve Stack doing an interview talking about me, and I was, once again, the nanny go rider, and uh, that's Eddie's by anyway. Uh, I uh, just... <laughs> We, uh, we had this bucket of horse shit in the back, and some of the guys would take a leak in it and everything else because they knew it was going to go out what was going to happen. We went and had the, before the people came in, we took the the bucket of horse shit and put it under the podium. Oh, my God. Bobby comes up there, and he talks, and, and he challenges me to a match, and I say, why don't you get in the ring now? And he, he says, no, nah, and he, he's doing his thing. Anyway... Uh, I, uh, 
he slapped me in my left ear. He was right-handed, obviously. He slapped me in my left ear and blew my eardrum out. And when he did that, I had, you know what, tinnitus or tinnitus is, you know, it rings. I still have it. But anyway, uh, well, turns around, and I take this bucket of horseshit. And folks, if you're listening, this is the gospel. I emptied that whole thing on top of his head. And uh, I hope they paid him well for that. Because it was, I, no one has ever done it. Don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, it was just, oh, it was a mess. Steve Stack had to go change his clothes. I had to go change my tights and boots. Oh, but it popped like crazy. It is a you know? And uh, we. And go I ahead. want to tell you something, brother. It is immortalized on video for the entire world to see. <laughs> and if well, you, you haven't know, seen that, it, that Jaggers, go check it out. Hey, Jaggers, Jaggers was a piece of shit. I'll never forget I heard that. that. You know, I heard that for when, sure. When he, when hey, when when he, you know, if his lips was moving, he was lying. And so Jerry Briscoe, you'll love this, Scott. Jerry Briscoe calls me, and he says, you know, Bobby Jaggers died. I said, oh, I'll be damned. I said, you know, Jerry, I guarantee you that son of a bitch is up there lying to God right now. <laughs> and that's the truth. That's the truth. yes. <laughs> that's exactly what I said to Jerry Briscoe. It's like, I have a well, first thing you know come I guarantee you, he's lying to God right now. Guarantee you. Because he had to lie to get, he had to get, he had to lie to get past uh, St. Peter. You know? Yeah, he right. He told him a good lie. Yeah. And so he got to God, so you know he's lying to him. Well, let's talk about the, yeah. the people of that caliber. Uh, there was another guy in Southwest that sometimes gets overlooked because he made the uh, transition to world class and is largely known for his tenure in world class. But you, uh, both of you worked with a gentleman named Gino Hernandez. Talk to me about your memories of Gino. Well, I remember Gino had the same kind of attitude that Tully had and they thought they were better than sliced bread. And, uh, you know, and I'd been in the business 12, 15 years at the time, and, it, and Gino started his bullshit with me. I, God rest his soul. I have nothing against the man. But I told him, I said, I don't want to hear your bullshit. You can rattle off all you want to these young guys. I said, but I've heard it all, and I know it all, and I know when you're bullshitting and when you're telling the truth. And he laughed. He started laughing. And after that, I got his ultimate respect because I stood up to him. But Gino got him like Tully, and they thought they were better than everybody else. And, you know, in a way, it, it helped him in the wrestling world because it helped him make money. But, uh, you know, it's just, you know, there's guys that way. You know, they think that uh, nobody can touch them. Nobody's as good as they are. And uh, that's just the way it was but you know god rest his soul he was a good soul and uh, when i had him away from the ring and and talking to him he was a completely different person <clears throat> into yeah, that yeah. story well then then uh let me ask you something else we we touched on some of the talent obviously the the focus tonight's been you guys working with each other and you're um completely flattering non-biased opinions of your former champions and stuff like that. But um, I'm curious, since you mentioned Gino and some of the other talent that came through the Southwest, do you guys have any good stories about <clears throat> somebody, you, other people you've worked with besides each other? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can we, remember. There was a lot of guys. I mean, I, I, I worked yes, on my 33rd remember. day. Well, one at a time. Hold on, Eddie. Let me tell you this story. I still have the scar <laughs> where Armand Hussein locked up with me, and he had this long fingernail, and he just sliced it. And I don't know whether you've ever seen a cheekbone. It looks just like an eggshell on the on the outside. I and oh, I was so mad. It was my 33rd birthday. We were going to go out and celebrate and have a good time. And... 
Yeah, it, it, it took he, he 16 stitches to... Yeah. Man. But I, I was still pretty. <laughs> well, you still go ahead, well, Eddie. I tell you. Absolutely. Yeah. How about you, Eddie? But I tell you, I mean, well, you know, uh, with Scott and, and like, Wahoo, it was uh, uh, Terry Funk and myself. Uh, in a tag match, it, we had this a couple of times in Corpus Christi. I mean, we had riots. I mean, people don't even know what riots are anymore. We had riots no. back then, and we had and shit. We'd have to fight our way back to the damn dressing room, and it was unbelievable. And I'll never forget that night. I said, I think I grabbed you in a headlock and ran you back to the dressing room one time, Eddie, because of the riots. I'm yeah, not sure did. it, it, it comes to mind. Yeah, you get. Yeah, you had to get my ass out of there. I said, shit, that's my payday they're trying to kill out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and I told Terry, don't you turn around and yell at him. Let's keep moving. You know, they're throwing belt buckles and everything else at him. He turned around. He said, you stinking, rotten Mexican. About that time, boom. He got stuck right in the, God. Right in the throat with a, with a knife. And he looked at me and he said, that son of a bitch stabbed me. I said, well, I told you not to stop. And he says, let's go. I said, now you want to go. Okay, uh, so we, we, we got back. But that's Terry. And I'll never forget this, God, and I don't know if I ever told you this. The night we drew that big house and, and uh, we set the record in San Antonio, uh, Funk Jr. and Terry came over to me. I was lacing my boot up. And they looked at me and they said, hey, I just want to tell you, you you and Scott Casey drew this house. None of us in here drew this house. You and Scott Casey drew this house. We were all here before. We could I, You know, what got me, right underneath us, they had a six-man tag match. I mean, three on each side. Everybody had to get in there to get the money. But I, I'm glad you held them up. <laughs> exactly. So uh, you guys, yeah. uh, so so Joe Blanchard starts this group uh, somewhere around 77, 78, right? Around 1978. And so what, Southwest to, Wrestling? Yeah, South, Southwest. I was earlier than that. It was probably around 72, 73. Was it I really? think, because I was down there eight or nine years. Oh, Okay. Is that about right, Eddie? About 72, because I'm thinking 77, 78. Yeah, but I wasn't in, I, I didn't come, I didn't come around there till, till late, late. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and he, he, by, by that time he, he got his stuff together, got, got TV and, and really got, you know, it got Wahoo in there, got Scotty in there, got, you know, he had Pusky in there and, and started getting some talent in there. And that's and exactly so, where I'm going with it. Yep, Eddie, you, you, Eddie, stay with me on this too, because that's a perfect segue. And I'm glad Scott. I'm glad you said that it was earlier than that, because my, as far back as I go with Southwest is '77, '78 when when I discovered it. But I know that it was a rapid ride to start him with Southwest because they the company as as a company and as an entity it pretty well only lasted till about nineteen eighty five or eighty six, am I right? And then yeah, that's when the cocaine you're right. run out. Yeah and then that's and when then the cocaine run out. I was gonna ask you because I heard <laughs> no and he's actually believe it or not, he's got some validity to that. Because I heard what the problem was, was that a lot of drugs were going through that area. A lot. Um, well, well, Fred Barron's, Fred Barron's was probably one of the biggest coke dealers in, you know, the United States. On, on, on Well, let, let's put it the Southwest United States. Okay. And, um, and he had a, you know, have you ever known a guy that could sell cars, you know, not own the thing? And have a have a ranch out there in Bernie, Texas. You remember that ranch, Scott? And uh, I, I, yeah, I, I took I, my horse out there and rode him through the front door of his house. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's right. You sure did. Well, the the so reason anyway. I'm, yeah, the reason I'm going there, you guys, is because, like I said, you know, um, if, if, if you say 1972, I'm saying 77, so give or take a couple of years. Point is, somewhere in the mid 70s to 85, 86, right? Somewhere around here. So the company has a rapid You're right. Yeah, but it was later. It, it was, yeah, it was later. It was more like uh, it, it started, it, Southwest really grew in 1980. That's okay, when right. Right. Casey and myself got there. That's when we started popping that thing. Uh, well, all the rest of the years there. were a waste of time. Huh? Eddie, you got there in, in 82, right? No, I got there in 1980. And oh, I stayed really? there till uh, yeah, 80, 81, 82. Oh. And I got out of there at the end of 82. Yeah. And and the, the cowboy, did you go did they, you they, follow they, they had they 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 had to run they ran me out because Tully was so jealous of me, you know, and, yeah, and Scott heard. that it, he he didn't he didn't you know, he didn't want me around because me and see, I could have turned baby face and me and Scott could have teamed up against Gino and 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 Mr. Prick, and 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 had another run, and then I could have turned on Scott, and me and him would have had another run, another year would have kept it going. And, well, but, it, but, is know, it they, fair to say you left a lot of money on the table? It is it fair to say you left a lot of money on the table? Yeah, they left a lot on there. Believe me. Yeah. Man. So now, Cowboy, um, so you and Eddie. Yes, sir. You, you work in this program till, uh, till what, till the end of this thing or till the company goes bust or did you leave before the company folded? Hey, hey, me and Scott Casey didn't bust no fucking company, number one. Number two, we left, when I left, we were selling out everywhere. The only reason I left was because the prick screwed me on my payoff. Right. You know, I and never that's the implied. I left. I I, I, want, I want to clarify something because it's important. I never implied that you and Scott busted the territory. What I said was that the company went bust. The company itself went broke in 1988. That's a fact. That's a matter of public record. Um, and I know that. I believe Fred Band was Bobby the reason. Jaggers Say again, Scott. No, it's just like. Say again, Scott. Hello. Yeah. Say, yeah. Say, say that again. What, what was the reason? I said I believe it was Fred Barron. You yeah. Know, I, I think he yeah. was the reason, you know, because either Joe got tired of doing it or got sick or something. I don't know. Because yeah. by that time, I had gone away from it. I, I think it was like 87 or something like that. When he Baron came in there, I didn't stay, and I went up to Dallas for about six months, and then I got my uh, chance to go to the WWF. So Okay, because here's what went. happens then. There's something interesting happens then. Around 85, 86, toward the end of Southwest, world class and some of the Texas territories start absorbing some of the talent from Southwest. And guys who never got over in Southwest were now all of a sudden becoming stars. Now, my question to both of you seasoned veterans, is that a, uh, and Dan's laughing at me, uh, is that a, a testimony to the Texas territories or is that a black eye on Southwest? For not utilizing well, something. Let me sound. tell you something. If, if 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 the son of a bitch couldn't get over on Southwest Championship <laughs> Wrestling, uh, he ain't gonna get over anywhere else. And, and the only reason he got over anywhere is because they didn't have any other talent. I can tell you that. That's my point, Eddie. Thank you for going. That's why I said stay with me on this. Now because let's one talk thing about one that. thing about it, Scott Scott Casey will will tell you exactly what I'm saying. If you didn't oh, yeah. get up and go and you had you had to bring it every night. Yeah. I mean this is Texas. 
this is this is not some kind of little fluffy ass damn little place you go hang out. Man, yeah. we used to move them tables. We used to have all brawls all over the damn buildings and everything, oh. man. And and oh, you know, yeah. you had to be a pretty tough guy to handle all this shit, you know. And 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 we we didn't play. Texas wrestling was was tough. Oh, straight. And, sure. and, Absolutely. So let me ask you and, then, you know, here, Scott. No, let me ask you something, Angelo. What, what yes, you sir. forgot to bring up is this. Okay, Scott Casey got over. Bigger, better, drew more money than Wahoo McDaniel. Ivan well, Hutchins. we're actually going to talk about that. Don't Chavo, forget. Chavo, hey, Chavo Guerrero. All these other guys are supposed yeah. to be so great, but but no, the Cowboy outdrew them all by accident. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk a lot about that, in fact. Don't forget, it is a two-hour show. Well, I, I, I'll tell you right now, for saying that, Eddie, that's very flattering. You know, of course, it always takes two of you in the ring to dance. But anyway, I I, I have to well, give a lot of credit. Goes, I got. I have to interrupt you, Scott, because I want to say something. You're you're a humble guy, but I need to say something for the record. Okay, so so hear me out and just okay. It's true. You're absolutely right. It takes two people to dance in the ring. But one of those guys is always going to shine. One is always going to shine. And that's the guy that people pay money to see. And you're that guy. So uh, I appreciate your humility, but keep it real around here. Um, we are up on the hour. Yeah, you know, it's like I was going to say. So, Angelo. Yes, sir. Well, hey, with the people, hush. Uh, what, well, what, I'm, I'm coming up. I, I, yeah. I'm uh, Eddie. I'm, I'm. You'll appreciate this being in television. I'm coming up on a hard break, so I got to do my commercial okay, here. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hit it. Okay. Yeah. Um. <laughs> the longest I'm going to get to talk tonight. The. Uh, or you know, we we obviously uh, take good care of each other, and we've we've. Uh, talked a lot tonight but we do want to do our shout out our sponsor for today's episode is manscaped.com manscaped.com is the leading producer and supplier of man trimming products their current package includes the lawnmower 3.0 which is the number one rated trimming uh, man trimmer on the market and it's a bundle deal it includes a deodorizer uh, refreshing spray a deodorant they have a package of new wipes it all comes in a leather carrying case uh, you can use promo code Wrestling Future for 20% off uh, at manscaped.com. Promo code Wrestling Future, 20% off your purchase. They also have the Weed Whacker, which is a nose and ear trimmer, among other products. Manscaped.com and promo code Wrestling Future. Your balls will thank you. Your balls will thank you. Hell, you need it. Hey, you need to send that to Bret Hart. <laughs> <laughs> I got that one. Thank you. I got that one, Eddie. Thank you. You got that one, Eddie Scotty. <laughs> yes, sir. I got that one, brother. Okay, so now. Angelo. Yes, sir. Yes, Scott. You were, I was trying to say before the mouth on the other end has gotten way again. Hold on, Eddie. I love you. But anyway. The thing I think that helped me get over more than anything else in the world, and it was such a simple thing, I was in Los Angeles, and I was out there talking, and I, I see Luthez, and he's peeping through the curtains, and this is the first match. And I walked up to him, and for all you people that don't know who Luthez was, he was like, seven or eight time world champion i mean he would literally went around the world that many times tremendous tremendous worker and i asked him i said legit Lou, legit. Yeah. what are you doing he, i said you're the world you've been world champion he said scott and i'll never forget this he said you can always learn you can always steal you can always put it into your repertoire different moves and it'll help you get over and that's what I credit a lot to. God rest your soul, Lou. I loved you to death. And, uh, it, it, you know, it, it was true. And after that, I don't care where I was at, whether it be Madison Square Garden or uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, I would be looking at the matches through the curtains to learn things. Because, you know, you, your mind goes one way and your body goes another sometimes with this stuff. 
And oh, wow. it just, I learned a lot. You know, I mean, there was a, a lot of tremendous, tremendous wrestlers that uh, I, I can't give credit to all of them at one time, but they they just, I, I, I took, I, I stole things, I used them in the ring, uh, I, I used moves, I used expressions, I used things on interviews, and for all you young guys out there who are hopefuls that want to wrestle, let me tell you, you can have the best looking body in the world, like say the Ultimate Warrior or somebody like that. You can uh, have the best moves in the ring and wrestle, and their timing can be great. But if you cannot, and I cannot stress this enough, if you cannot talk on that microphone, you might as well hang your tights up and go home and exactly. get a ticket for the next show. Exactly. Because that's what and made the end of story. One of the greatest talkers in the business, bar none, and we got him on the show tonight. Uh, and arguably, he is a guy who can work. And there's a big difference between wrestling and working. Eddie Mansfield is a worker, but bar none, Eddie Mansfield is the golden voice of the promo. Straight up. Straight shoot. This man can cut a promo on a dime. And I've seen him do it. He did it with me twice on the show tonight. Hey, let me tell you something about Eddie Mansfield. We'd be out there wrestling in the ring, and all of a sudden he'd save my bacon by telling me, okay, let's do this, let's do that. All right, and stop right here, and we'll get it done. Because, and I admired him for that. I never got pissed off at him or nothing because I knew what he knew what he was doing. The man was a natural at what he did. And let's Love you to death for it, Eddie. Scotty, let's talk about that. Well, Ed, I appreciate a that. Question Scotty. for you, Ed. Uh, and you and I have had some conversation before, but let's talk about something we've never discussed. You know, I know that the you know what. Let me back up for a second. The other night, Larry Zabisco was with us, and Larry said something really interesting. He said, "Back in the territory days, there weren't a lot of wrestlers because the business was so closed off from strangers." They didn't trust new people getting in. They didn't want new guys to come in because it, you know, it cut into their money and it cut into their time. Um, but a lot of guys that had talent and no training got in because of their promo skills. Larry was one of those guys like you, Eddie, who all he had to do was open his mouth and people hated him. Now, right. talk to me about this ability. You know, I know you've had some training, but the bottom line is what you have comes either instinctively or it's just bred in you. It's got to be something that's just part <laughs> of your DNA. Talk to me about the art and skill of being a pro wrestling promo guy. And you're one of the well, best. It, it's, it's, it's not only about being a wrestling promo guy. It's about, I'll never forget this. And, and Scotty mentioned L.A. Uh, I was on top for, for a while in L.A. And I was sitting, I'll never forget this, on, on seat 32 in the Olympic Auditorium next to, to uh, Leo Garibaldi. And I said, Leo... I said, I'm not one of the biggest guys in the world. I said, how can I, you know, be a star in this business and, and stay, stay on top? He said, well, Ed, he said, I can give you the finish. And this is where so many guys have missed the whole point about this business. I can give you the finish, but what you do in between the time they ring that bell and that finish will get you over or it will not get you over. It doesn't really matter who wins the match. It's how you allow them to win that match. And then it, wow. then you get your heat after that match, and then you grab that microphone, and you light somebody's ass up. It's like I would, I was just, if I was talking about, about, about Scott, I, I would say, you know, I was riding down the road the other day, right on the right. I went right by his ranch. And where, where, 
look at Scott Casey. What was he doing? He was out on a quarter horse roping a bunch of damn nanny goats. And, and can you imagine a cowboy roping nanny goats, and he calls himself a cowboy? I mean, for God's sake, he's a Rexall Ranger. He's not a cowboy. I mean, you know, and stuff like that. You got to get personal. And, yeah. and, and all, it, it, see, so many guys, they always were worried about uh, get, the, Chavo Guerrero's were the worst. He always had to get his hand raised. It's not about how many times you get your hand raised. It's how it, 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 a wrestling match is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, and, and you got to get to the dance to have the dance. And so you got to work it, and you work those people into a, a frenzy. And when that Scott Casey used to explode on me, you could hear that freaking building shake. I mean, you could actually hear the building shake. Oh yeah! And I mean, it was just unbelievable. And and that's the way you you work it. And and Scotty is like I told you on on shows before I was on with you. Scott is one of the most underrated baby faces in the history of professional wrestling. Absolutely. That's my and, buddy. And I've told you that. Well, thank you very much, Eddie. I- Well, like I said, it well, takes you know, two of us to dance. Go ahead. Yeah, but I can tell you one thing: we damn sure danced good. We danced all the way, man. We <laughs> sold out every single stinking from Waco to you know the the Von Erichs couldn't sell out Waco, but Scott Casey and Eddie Mansfield did. Scott, when uh, when you and Eddie, uh, when you and Eddie left. Southwest. Did you guys see the writing on the wall? Did you know that the that your time was up there? And how important? Well, I certainly did. I think so. I certainly did, Angelo. I certainly did when I saw my fucking paycheck. Well, I was going to talk to you about that. It was, you know, is there is there such a thing as like overstaying your welcome, especially when you know you're not getting your money's worth? Well, how can you? I think it is over when you're draw- when, when, when me and You're right. Scotty are drawing bigger houses than anybody, how can we overstay our welcome? Well, no, my, it was jealousy. my point was, it I was know. Pure jealousy. Well, I, I know some of the problems there were financially related. I know this because guys who uh, weren't worth it were getting more than uh, than they should have. You had, you know, for well, lack Angelo, of... Angelo, let me, let me explain this to you. Yes, okay, sir. Scott and myself would go in and, and, and sell out whether it's Corpus Christi or, or, or San Angelo or, or Laredo, Texas, wherever it was. Right. Do you realize that Tully Blanchard wasn't even on the card and he got the same main event money that we did? Do you and think that's, that's fair? And that's exactly what I just said. That's exactly what I just said. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, there were a lot of guys in that territory who sucked it dry financially. So for, for you, Eddie, when did you realize, was, was that the point? Was you, knowing that you weren't getting your money, it was time for you to go. How about you, Scott? Was well, it the same thing? Well, do you want me to answer or do you want Scott to answer? Well, I want Scott to answer that last part. Go ahead, Eddie. No, Scott, well, I was asking well, you. When, I, well, I, 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 I learned from my when, when it was time for me to go from when they when they let uh, Wahoo go. Uh, Scott and myself was Wahoo's guys, and then then they brought in Buck Robley, and Buck had you know, and I'm a friend of Buck. Uh, you know, the, the Buck was, he was a good booker and, and he would, he would want me to ride with him. And I always rib him. Scott, I'd say, yeah, you must think I'm a damn idiot, Buck. You just trying to get a rub off me. That's all you're doing. You just try, you know, and, but one thing about it, Buck made sure I got my money before I left. Yeah. And that's one thing about Buck Robley. He always stood up for the guys. And and he always said to me about Scott, he says, 
you guys made this territory. And he said, I hate to see you leave. I said, well, what else would you like me to do? I said, they're trying to run me out the damn door. Yeah. It's a shame. Cowboy, how about you? Uh, that old saying, money talks and bullshit walks. And that's what happened that's finally. You know, you, you, yeah, you, you, you can see the writing on the wall, you know, and if they want to go a different direction, they've got uh, different bookers in there. Let them try to do it. Let them see if they can make the the moves and, and make the money that we drew for them. I don't think they could. You know, it's just right. sad yeah, they but never true. Did. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it could be a cutthroat business, and uh, we all know that. And uh, it's just like uh, when after I left S- Southwest Wrestling, I went up to New York. The very first match I had, I put somebody over, and I said, "Whoop! Well, this ain't going to last long. I stayed there for almost three years, but you'd, I just, they they never used me. So I knew the writing was on the wall. It's just like down, down in Texas. The writing was on the wall. It was time to go, and I did. Well, let me uh, let yeah. me ask you. you we you were talking about you, obviously it's come up a lot tonight about the draw and, and bringing in the tickets and the venues and all or uh, selling out the venues. That's something I wanted to focus on. Is Southwest was famous for some of their venues. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we talked where you guys put in San Antonio. Um, do you have any? Can you kind of just just touch on some of the big venues you guys played? Because the, the history of some of the buildings are so tied to wrestling before they were tied to say basketball or some of some of what they're known for now. You want to go first? Uh, if you're talking to me, I, I, I'm not really following you. What you mean by the venues? I mean, do you, do you want to know what, arenas, what we the did in the ring or in. the money we made or no? no, the no, no it was, what, what Dan is asking is, talk about some of the famous wrestling buildings in, in Southwest and Texas, in that area. Oh, okay. Well, well, well obviously, you, you had San Antonio. We didn't do Dallas because Fritz had that. Uh, yeah. Corpus Christi. Uh, there weren't that many big, big places. There was, like, uh, I'm trying to remember... Uh, Waco. I'm trying to remember some of the other. Waco, yeah, Waco. Brown, Waco Brown, was a hard place Brown, to sell Brown. out, but Eddie and I well, did. I we sold it out, but it was a. Like, the, you know, the, the heritage yeah, Brownsville, of Brownsville, Laredo. Um, Jesus, I mean, you you put you thought, uh didn't we well, didn't we sell out Abilene too, Scott? Didn't they put us on that Abilene tour? Um, yeah, we did. Uh, and, uh, did. and what's his name? Uh, 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 what's uh, Slatton, uh, the lawman? That was his promotion down there, and we sold it out. He was grinning yeah. so hard. He said, "I never thought I'd see this," but we did. We got it done. <laughs> yeah, you we just, did. It. Absolutely. Did either of you guys? It's just a lot of hard that? work. Well, well let, let, excuse me. Have either of you guys worked the? Uh, one of the most famous buildings in, in the area, the Dallas Sportatorium. I know Dallas belonged to Fritz, but, you know, a lot of people went in and out of the Sportatorium. Yeah, we both worked that, but, you know, that was a real shithole. <laughs> well, Dan, talk to Eddie about the shithole called the Sportatorium. Well, yeah, you know, it, oh. it's funny. You're, you're not the first person who's mentioned that. I'm curious if you have a specific story. Shithole. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious if you have a specific story story that soured you on it, or was it just constant crap that you had to deal with being there? What, hey, hey, I'm not. Hey, I'm not soured on any building. It wasn't. Hey, it, it's just you know that's you know until Scott and myself started going into big arenas. The, the the and then then the New York guys w- were going into the big arena. Southwest Championship Wrestling was one of the first promotions to go in big buildings, and that's why people don't understand. We were one of the first to go in the big buildings, and and we wasn't just wrestling in little shitholes like the rest of the the the, the promotions were. 
because they wanted to sell all the money. Well, but, then, but you, had well, re, oh, you had reunion hall, you had reunion, you know, yeah. in, in Dallas, and and we had the hemisphere in San Antonio. And so, I mean, we, you know, we could go neck and neck with anybody. Well, and let me so, tell you something. I'll put, I'll put our crew up against anybody, anytime, anywhere. They can bring it. And, and Southwood Championship Wrestling was, hey, when Scotty and me were on top, there, there wasn't any better. We, we, well, we did the job. You, uh, you, you talk arenas. Let me ask you something. The Southwest filmed at a place in San Antonio called The Junction. Um, I, we've heard a lot of stories yeah, about legend. that. that That's I'm, legendary. That's I was legendary. just about to say, I'm, yeah. I'm only 37, so most of the history of that building predates me. I was wondering if you have any good stories from The Junction. Well, they damn sure had some good tacos next door. I can tell you that. Yes, we did. Um, <laughs> I want you to know, uh, my my wife's in the background. She was born in San Antonio. She just fist, fist bumped your uh, your taco comment. She well, remembers I was that area. Everybody know, and Scott Casey said it for the record. So I'm just going to reiterate this. Scott Casey said the best taco he ever had was in New Jersey. And that's he said it on this show for the record. Am I right, Scott? No, he was. Absolutely. He's, he's I'll back you 100% on guy. that. Where? Uh-huh. Where? Uh-oh. Well, he, he, he that, that, you know, you, you got to understand the cowboy has a tendency to get drunk every now and then. And so. <laughs> a little bit. It, 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 and, and so if he, if he said that Taco was good in New Jersey. Oh my goodness gracious! He must have been that, was he was <laughs> that was probably that was probably Chihuahua meat, you know. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> no, he's oh, talking about the Jersey so tacos. That's funny. Well, let but me let me ask had you. Hey, you know, hey, hey, guys, Go ahead. You know, San Antonio, San Antonio is known for the puffy taco. There's a difference, puffy. You get it? Puffy had taco? taco. Oh, you yeah. never had a puffy uh, they taco? Had a, they're called meat. I don't know whether the meat is that? still there or not, but it has the damnedest food oh, I ever had. Yeah. Meat Terrors. Oh, yeah. I love meat Terrors right across from the Alamo. Meat Terrors was the best food. Oh, my goodness. And, and I think they're still there, Scott. Um, man, was that good. Meet Terrace was the best. <laughs> San Antonio well, was a great town. It really let, was. Let, let me ask you as we as we wrap up then then to finish on a on a fun note. You guys talked a lot about traveling. The final question for both of you then, um, for for the years and, and experience you spent on the road. Where's the best food you've ever had traveling on the road? Best food. Yeah, just period. Well, probably down there in Texas, you know, if you like Mexican food, and I loved it, you know. I mean, hell, yeah. I grew up on it, but uh, that meat is you know, one of them. It's, Scotty, it's, got it's called Paisano's. And, and, it's just, and it's also there was a place so called Paisano's. It was a re- Italian restaurant down there. That's unbelievable. I don't know if it's still there or not, but hell, I hadn't been back in years. Yeah, but boy, they had some food down in San Antonio. If you can't get good food in San oh. Antonio, it's it's your own fault. I mean, cause <laughs> they got such a, a it's a culture. It's a culture down there, you know, with food. It's really, really cool. Oh, yeah. us, you know? Yeah. And anytime, uh, I'll anytime tell you what, your girlfriend, you know, anytime I, I your think... girlfriend's mad at you, Angelo, just take her down to San Antonio. She'll get happy. So I'll have to ask my wife's permission first. <laughs> I got to ask my wife's permission to take my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Well, that's where I'll be on your wife's shit list for telling, showing you that. I'll be, be, be yeah, an ex-wife. I traveled to San Antonio without her. You guys are are are, are incorrigible. I love you. Um, well, I'll tell you what, Eddie, Scotty, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to say good night to both of you. Eddie, uh, where can yep. people reach hey, your hey, social media? Hey, 
you be sure everybody that's listening, you yeah. need to buy Cowboy Scott Casey's book. Because let yeah. me tell you something. Scott Casey is one of the best guys in the whole wide world. And I tell you what, me and that cowboy made more money by accident than most people did by trying. And, <laughs> and you need to support his he book. Didn't like either. Right. And, and I well, Eddie, him. I love you for that. And Angela, once you well, cut off, I'll hold on because I wanted to ask. Yes, sir. Okay. Angela, when you get through with this, hold on so I can ask you something, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, you guys, go ahead. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us, Angelo. And Dan, you just talk too damn much. <laughs> <laughs> too, too much? I got 10 words in with you two. I'm telling you what. I, I told <laughs> Dan he got five words in the night. Right? Apparently 10 words hey, too you need many. To understand something, Dan. When, when you got two guys that can talk on, on the same show, you're lucky if you get two words in. <laughs> I had to have him do my commercial at least, <laughs> right? Hey, and, and always thank remember, you, brother. Guys, I'll, hey. I'll touch space with you in a day or two. Hey, you guys take care, and thanks so much for having me on and Scotty on, and Quite and be welcome. sure to plug his book and all the all oh, the absolutely. Southwest Championship Wrestling fans. Please buy his book because it's it's a hell of a book, and he's a hell of a guy. Thank you guys absolutely. so much. Have a good night. Thanks, Thank Eddie. You. Take care. Good night. Eddie Mansfield, everybody. All right, Scotty, you're still with me, right? Yeah, I'm still here. All right, there we go. Okay, so I you're need still... to ask you something. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, you, a female wrestler by the name of Candy Devine called me, and she said, how do I get podcast internet on my phone? Oh, wrestling with the future. I have no idea what that means. Sure. Excuse me, what? I will take care of Candy Divine, not a problem. I will send all the links to you. Okay, I appreciate it. You uh, got it's it. been a lot of fun, and I'll do it for you anytime. You get in a bind, give me a holler. I'll be glad to help you. Oh, all right? I know, and I want everybody to know that I am promoting your book right behind me. It's called One Last Ride, The Tales of Cowboy Scott Casey. Co-authored by Nick Massey. He's a buddy. He's been on the show with Scott. Get the book. It is available everywhere. Books are available on Amazon, Dalton Bookseller, Barnes & Noble. You can get it everywhere. So uh, so get Scott Casey. What's it, like 20 bucks, Scotty? And just to be, if, if, if you're going through the mail, it's thirty seven fifty. If you're not... It's thirty dollars. Thirty, okay. I was not sure if it was twenty. Okay. You got it. Absolutely, yeah. brother. Well, listen, my friend. Thank you for All joining. Right. Me. I'm gonna. I'll probably give you a holler tomorrow because I want to talk to you about some stuff anyway. All righty. Okay, and uh, let me give me that stuff so I can tell Candy how to watch to watch your, our show or listen Absolutely. to our show. Oh, okay. Actually, she can watch it and listen to it. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Take care. All right. Have a good night. Scott Casey, everybody. Bye-bye. Daniel? Yes, sir. I think the word count for you and I combined might be 20. <laughs> 20, Maybe. 20, 25 tops. Yeah, tops. When you go, Well, first of all, when you got Eddie Mansfield on... Right. Just shut up and sit back and listen. Well, I, I love I love the fact that we were keeping count of the, uh, of the number of cutoffs. I... I know the yeah. how pretty how sad is that shit? <laughs> hey, you know what you you were trying you kept trying to throw it throw it to me, but you got you got two talkers that just let them go. Yeah, but you know what he says. You know, before I was rudely interrupted, man. I'll, let me tell you something, brother. How did Wahoo McDaniel would say it? Listen, motherfucker. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll interrupt you some more. <laughs> That's funny. Because I'm good like that. Just ask the end man. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, we got through another one. Okay. Yes, kid. sir. So, uh, just so everybody knows, you're not going to be with me Tuesday. You've got another commitment. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Messier will be with me Tuesday. Um, we are bringing back, oh, on Tuesday, really important guest, and I want to tell everybody. On Tuesday, 
Seth Turner, one of the founding members and president of the International Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. Uh, he and Tony Villano uh, saw this vision to fruition. Trust they that one there. Um, and Seth is the uh, the kind of the uh, the young uh, buck that took control of this thing, and uh, he's a guy that's got a lot of uh, wrestling knowledge and history into him. Right, Fair young man, but uh, but he's steeped in wrestling history. He really loves his wrestling and. Correct me if I'm wrong. That he was the one you posted the link to, where they had just recently acquired Bruno's original belt, right? Exactly right. Yes, they they did acquire it for their museum. It was the actual belt that Bruno won. He got. They got it from the San Martino family. They actually donated it to the museum. Nice. And because that's what Bruno would have wanted. Um. And if you, you know, Bruno is funny because Bruno often gave, I don't know if you know this, Dan, but Bruno often gave that replica belt to people he would meet. Oh, nice. Uh, you, yeah, you can, he actually gave one to a Bruno Mars, who he's named after. You know, Bruno Mars is named after Bruno San Martino. Bruno Mars' dad was a wrestling fan. Of course. And he was a Bruno fan. So he named Bruno Mars, Bruno after Bruno San Martino. That's but great. Bruno often give that belt, but yeah, they Seth uh, acquired that from the family. Um, he's also got some some breaking news he wants to share with us, and we may be breaking some news of our own on that day um, with regards to this podcast, and we're just going to keep mums on that for a little bit. But yes, let me tell you who's coming up. Uh, again, you know, uh, Seth Turner next week on the 24th, um, we have with us on December the 1st, the return of Nick Christopher. And uh, he is the, uh, that amazing author of crime novels on the Greek and Italian mob and the Irish mob. And, uh, um, he will be with us to uh, continue his conversation. What a fascinating writer this man is. I love talking to mob authors. You know, he <laughs> and George Anastasia. Well, I would love to get both of them guys. Right, I'd that'd be love wonderful. To get John A. Light on the show. Oh man, I would love to get him on here, even if he called in. If you <laughs> call me, <laughs> give me a call. My number's on the link. <laughs> Anyway, so Dan, what you got going on in the world of Sebastiano? Well, I mean, like you said, um, I'll be out next week. We're not recording Thanksgiving Day. We'll be back on the 1st. We have a lot of uh, stuff about some re recurring guests and some some new faces that are coming back. Uh, yeah. And then we'll, we'll we could finish up the, the month and then, or excuse me, finish up the year. And then bright and, uh, bright and early January, we'll be back with a new coat of paint and ready to go. Oh, boy, we got a brand new coat of paint. Yeah. Well, December will be an abbreviated month, of course, because of Christmas and the holidays. Um, we'll probably do, we may do a total of four shows for December, maybe. Um, we, we, of course, we will stop recording. The last show before Christmas will be that Tuesday. Uh, and, of course, the first show for the new year will be the first Tuesday of 2021. And so it's real easy to remember. Right. So we don't do uh, any show on Christmas. We, we never do a show on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. That's that's reserved for family and friends and uh, and getting right with the, you know, whoever your God is. Um but with me, I'll be spending time with family and getting fat and eating whatever my <laughs> wife decides to cook. And so, for Dan the Man, for myself, Angelo DeZipio, thank you for joining us on Wrestling with the Future. Happy wrestling, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time.